Cash, uh, Cash, thank you very much indeed. Um, I'm great. It's great that I've met the Robin Hood of the music industry. <laughs> well done. And I should tell you, Nazreen, I do wear sneakers. I just have to, have to wear brogues today. And in a moment, I may take my tie off. And certainly all our work at Thinking the Unthinkable has been very much thinking of Gen Z. Now, look, we've got 35 minutes. It's uh, full on this morning, N narrowing the delta the race to net zero emissions by 2050, and my panelists are coming up already. Um, but uh, what I want to do is fine tune. I hope my mic is, can you hear my mic? I want to fine tune it. It's not about narrowing. This is about accelerating, based particularly on what we heard in the first session. Since Glasgow, uh, in the last two months, um, we've heard from the IPCC. They've produced two working group reports which are really sinister and disturbing. Uh, the analysis is deeply worrying. In the last few days, the IMO have warned that actually we're facing at least one year in the coming five years when temperatures will go over 1.5 degrees and probably irreversibly. UN Secretary General Guterres warned when he announced the uh, working group three just literally a month ago it is now or never. We are breaching tipping points. We are facing significant problems on planetary boundaries. We are breaching them. Alok Sharma, the president of uh, COP26, said only a few days ago, six months after Glasgow, uh, that 1.5 degrees uh, is now uh, weak. It remains weak. Is my microphone all right or not? OK, I hope you can hear me. Um, and Secretary General Guterres, can you hear me, yes or no? Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah good, yeah. okay. Secretary General Guterres also said one other thing, which I have to put on, on the agenda today. He said at the launch of Working Group 3, many governments and many corporates are lying. His word, very undiplomatic, are lying when it comes to commitments on green. So that is the framing for uh, our guests, and I'm going to introduce each of them when uh, they speak. But I'd like to go, first of all, to Melissa McDonald. Well, welcome, Melissa, um, uh, particularly because of all your work uh, in, uh, in the tracking uh, of what you're doing. Can you explain what you're up to and where, where your tracking is taking an understanding of what companies and governments are doing? So our um, tracking of, of the world's listed companies shows that they are currently on track to, uh, to meet a temperature rise of three degrees, which is double that which the science tells us is necessary for us to avoid. And it's good data, is it? We're very comfortable with the data. Um, we take the reported data uh, and supplement that with um, our own estimations of scope three. Uh, that's then normalized um, to uh, remove any you know, ir irregularities. We then uh, regularly have um, intuitive analyst uh, testing of the models, and it's showing that um, our models are aligned 70% of the time. So we are more confident in the data than, than, than ever. Confident in the data, and what is the message you're getting? So the message, when we take that data and put it into a forward-looking implied temperature model, is that we are burning through the carbon budget uh, very quickly. We have only... Much faster than most think they are burning through it. Correct, yes. And as of August 21, fewer than 10% of the companies in the, the universe that we track, which is over 9,000 listed companies, um, are on uh, track fewer than 10% are on track to meet the one and a half degree uh, targets. And we're burning through the allocated carbon budget. We'll be running out within six years. So what you're doing at MSCI is putting on the agenda the fact that many companies and many of those involved probably don't even realize the enormity of what they're burning and it's happening much quicker than they thought. That's correct, yeah. Look, uh, looking, using a forward-looking metric, which is uh, aligned with the TCFD portfolio alignment team recommendations on, on standardizing these types of metrics. And what happens when you confront them with the data? The, the, they, want to, they want to understand uh, how to you know, decompose and how to do better. That is you know, generally the message that we're getting from our colleagues in the research center. 
That's why I say that we, it's not about narrowing the delta, it's about accelerating the delta, because, and several of you are nodding here, and I think others are, are nodding, I can see as well. Let me move on to the experience inside KSA, uh, to Mahal Al-Nuad, who is uh, uh, GM of Sustainability Development uh, at STC, the big uh, telecommunications company. Welcome, Maha. Um, what are you learning? What have you learned in recent months uh, on the radical thinking necessary for you and colleagues to embrace what is needed to achieve net zero? Uh, thank you, Nick. Uh, actually, we com uh, STC committed to net zero uh, by 2050. We are uh, in processing and establishing a uh, science-based target. Uh, we try to work heavily with our partners, with our clients, uh, to create uh, more uh, services uh, to reduce this target, uh, to speed up uh, But what the you're target. trying to generate is new thinking, <clears throat> new approaches, new innovations. How speedily are you able to do that? I will give you one example, which is always we're proud of it. We have a solution, which is a, a virtual health clinic surface uh, smart surfaces, which is will will affect this target to to uh, to accelerate uh, the carbon footprint early, and to give an example to other uh, companies to work uh, at the same level. How are you doing on incentivizing uh, those you're involved with? to shift towards circularity, mm. to shift towards a new way of thinking. After all, it's six months at the same time as the big summit uh, in, in Riyadh in October, the big FII summit, that really much moved forward. How much, have you, how much change have you really seen? Uh, I think we do take an action uh, uh, with the ESG file in Saudi Arabia, and uh, it's a must. But uh, working with uh, such as uh, partners, uh, BIF, Ministry of Commerce, and uh, different partners uh, and peers like Aramco Sabak, and uh, as a teleco company, uh, or one of the biggest, uh, biggest company, uh, digital company in the region, we play um, yeah, uh, a great role to uh, increase the impact, to achieve the target earlier, uh, to link with Vision's uh, uh, 2030 vision of uh, Saudi Arabia. Now, Bob Mann, um, you're working in uh, KSA. You've been there for three years. What kind of changes are you seeing? Because we're talking about both the potential and the reality of dramatic changes in thinking on, in these areas. Yeah, look, I think in my, my short time working with KSA, I've been just impressed by a few things. One, the social change that's happening the environment, the energy, the engagement of youth uh, that's happening there, but also in the commitment to the role that Saudi Arabia can play in this transition that we've talked about. Right? When you look at the opportunity for world-leading low-cost renewable energy, for the world-leading carbon capture capability, uh, for advantage feedstocks on the hydrocarbon side that can also enable the transition as part of this next phase, it's a tremendous opportunity. It's a tremendous opportunity for leadership through the transition uh, for our assets, for our products, for the markets that we serve. So for us, uh, it's an exciting time. I mean, we, we talk a bit always about announcing the targets, like we announced our 2050 targets, Aramco has announced theirs as well. Uh, but we actually spent multiple years developing a roadmap to deliver those before we even made the announcements. Uh, and it's consistent not just with a responsibility to decarbonize, but an, a market opportunity for us, right? Because the companies that can lead through that transition to provide more circular products low-carbon products are the companies that are going to win the markets at the end of the transition. What about the overarching ambition, though? We talk about net zero. It's become part of the language. It's the, it's the ambition. But let me share with you a conversation I had with John Kerry only last week, where he said even net zero is not going to be enough. What is your view when it comes to pushing even harder than net zero? Yeah, great question. So I think first off, we need to be clear that I think driving absolute emission reductions is really what our mindset should be. This gets to this net zero. And comment. at high speed. Yeah, and at high speed. Uh, and, and I think one thing we should also be careful in these groups when we talk, we have a tendency at times, all of us, to make the issues sound very complex. Uh, and the implementation and what we're going to do, we tend to, to, to water that down with generalities, right? The reality is, for our industry specifically, uh, the issue to decarbonize is how do you generate heat through a different way, 
It's not more complex than that. 85% of the emissions from the chemical industry on scope one emissions come from the heat used to drive our reactions. So it's a simple issue from a, what causes the problem. You've got to generate heat by another source. And how are you going to do that? You're going to do it through use of renewable energy. You're going to do it through clean approaches that leverage hydrocarbons where you can capture that CO2. Uh, but the issue itself is, in terms of solutions, pretty clear cut. Where we sometimes suffer is in discussing what are the real things needed to make that transition happen, right? So just a few examples. You know, if we're going to drive renewable energy conversion, it's great to focus on EV automobiles, but if the grid is not expanded, if we don't invest in renewable energy supply, all of that's a pointless level of investment. Uh, we have to invest in carbon capture capability that can bring the cost of those activities down to impact the whole value chain in a better way. We have to electrify a lot of things that we use natural gas for today. Uh, we have to leverage blue and, and, this, and eventually green hydrogen much more in our processes. There are real technology solutions to drive those things, but those transitions are extremely complex to implement. And you know, when, we, when we talk about ESG investments, sometimes we have a tendency to simplify what that, you know, to, to talk generally about ESG investments. Well, technologies that might return 15 to 20 percent for investors might be ancillary to the actual core issues that have to be invested in to drive that transition. And to me, this is where I have the biggest concern and where we need the most support. But we're committed to investing in those technologies I highlighted. Uh, but we need the infrastructure to make that transition happen if we're going to accelerate. Well, we've heard two voices from uh, the kingdom. And I'll come to Saudi Aramco in a moment, if I may. But let's get more broadly uh, into the data that you've got from EY Jillian, your global sustainable finance lead partner. You've got a lot more data, more broadly than just the kingdom or the Middle East, about how much those out there who think they're going green really are. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, so I represent financial services, uh, work with financial services clients at EY on the sustainability agenda. Um, I think the first thing I'm going to pick up on is the interest, you know, the fact that there is an information gap between financial services and corporates. Um, so corporates telling their story so that financial services can truly interpret the risks, the rewards, um, as you've said, the investment plans, etc. And on the flip side, for the corporates to understand you know, how, how financial services operates. So we actually do quite a lot of work bringing together the real world economy and financial services. What's the data showing you? But the data, to your point, so we uh, annually assess around just over uh, 1,100 firms on their reporting of climate change. And very similar to the stats that Melissa came up with, our findings suggest that whilst uh, climate reporting from corporates is going up, only 42% do scenario modelling, and only 14% put climate change activity in their financial statement and accounts. 14%? 14%, yeah. Have you done a correlation between the 14% and how much say they're doing much more, but are not in reality? So, I mean, <laughs> the trick is, the, the point of the, re the report is to capture what is disclosed officially, right? Because, you know, uh, and of course, what we typically find is there, there may well be a lot more going on uh, than is disclosed. And particularly, there may be more positive activity than firms are willing to put into their, let's say, financial statement. But I think the journey of improving disclosures and reporting around climate change is one, you know, the ISSB, TCFD, maybe uh, reporting transition plans, as is a requirement or will be a requirement in the UK. I think the evolution of improved reporting um, and disclosures is, is a journey that we certainly encourage firms to go on. Let me put a thought to you. I mean, we're talking about the race to net zero emissions by 2050. Could I suggest that maybe it's more of an amble towards um, <laughs> a, a, a gentle walk? Or are they picking up speed? Are they in second and third gear or up to sixth gear? I mean, I'm, the scale of this is so enormous. But there are those out there, and I'm quoting again Guterres, what he said, the UN Secretary General, that many are lying about what they're really doing. Yeah, I can't comment on whether many are lying. Um, it's his but, word. <laughs> but, but what I would say is, you know, we had COP26 last year, so that's 26 years 
of talking about improving climate change. Okay, so it definitely feels that there needs to be more tangible proof, not just of what corporates are doing, but what corporates, governments, policymakers, and citizens, you know, we're all in this together. The collaboration here is absolutely critical. And if we've got COP27 this year, you know, the 27th year of talking about doing better. And Melissa, can I just come back to you before I go to Ashraf? Can that be achieved with the kind of data that you're picking up, the kind of, the, the kind of way you're collecting data, the willingness of those out there to be more transparent? Because they all say they want to be more transparent, but do they really understand what transparency means on, when it comes to data? Well, what we need is the, them to measure their emissions across all three scopes, and then when they put forward those commitments, they have to combine that with an action plan and signposts of where they expect to be along that journey. So the investors, and, and then obviously to report that in their financial report so that investors can make proper assessment uh, of, of whether they're credible, where the company is at. And I would just say, to add to that, you know, we are seeing the more advanced investors who are now looking for an annual breakdown, a quarterly breakdown, you know, as you say, well, they want to actually start measuring this much more frequently and be able to see what the tangible change is. Does that infect others? In other words, if there's a good story to tell, do others then try and match it, in your view, Gillian? Well, I think, um, as I say, for, for some of the more advanced uh, asset managers, what we see is they have made certain pledges so if, you know, if the firm's transition plan doesn't look like it's on track, then after three years, they may decide to divest um, or exclude that particular stock. So I think, you know, whilst we've seen limited action from investors to some extent um, on this agenda, there's certainly a group of investors, a growing group of investors who are looking to measure this a lot more tightly. Well, let me go to Ashraf, Ashraf Al-Ghazawi, your Vice President of Strategy and Market Analysis at Saudi Aramco. Tell us what is going to happen and what speed you have been operating. You now have your quarterly report from literally a few days ago was ginormous in terms of the profits you've shown uh, from producing the black stuff. What does this mean for your commitment on, on moving at speed towards net zero? Well, let me start by saying, I think to us, Saudi Aramco is, is in a position to, to lead in, in ESG uh, and, and energy transition, not just from its uh, financial position. You know, we believe we, we are the strongest company out there in terms of where our position, simply because the journey of ES, ESG for Saudi Aramco is not new. I recognize and respect that this term is fairly recent. Everybody's talking about it now, but to us, this is a journey that started in the 1970s. You know, the company- Were you openly talking about net zero then? Well, it was not net zero per se. The single most significant investment we've done in the 1970s, where we basically collected all our off gases to turbocharge the kingdom's industrial and chemical industry, that was in the 1970s, what we call the master gas system. This was the single most significant investment to reduce emissions from all our operations. We've had the best water practices since the 1970s, where we actually prohibit investments from using fresh groundwater. You look at also methane emissions. We're leading in terms of where we are in terms of methane, which is as, as you know, uh, harmful as, as carbon monoxide. To us, this is where we are today positioned to be the lead in this domain. You know, this is why we're the lowest in terms of upstream uh, emissions, uh, in terms of carbon intensity. This is pretty much in the company's DNA. We have the know-how, we have the experience. This is something that we've done before. We're also the first com among the first companies to experiment with carbon sequestration. So while people today call it net zero, to us, minimizing emissions and minimizing the impact to the environment has always been pretty much part of the company's DNA. Is accelerating to net zero a function of money and investment, or does that give you self-confidence, which means that you can drive faster to net zero because of the science, because of the looming sinister implications for planetary boundaries and tipping points. I'll, I'll touch on something that, that Bob mentioned. This is a test you know, the, 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 of the on-stage monitor. This the, is a test of the stage monitor. Who else would like to speak in this panel? <laughs> <laughs> Own up now. <laughs> no, the, the targets are, are pretty much set, you know, and, and, and to me, 
the, the, the speed and acceleration is one parameter. The, the, what, what's really missing today is that all stakeholders need to come together and work towards this. To me, there's, there's no use accelerating and moving faster if you're heading to the wrong direction. I think we all need to be, be cognizant that this is a complex issue. The, the goal, the aspirations may be simple, but getting there, having the right roadmaps and the part, you know, the, all the ingredients, you need, you need the industry, you need the policy makers, you need the investors, yeah. and you also need to, to include somewhat, you know, a stakeholder that has been absent from, from many of the transition But the existential today. threats are ev even more complex. So you've got to match the existential threat with the, the, the dynamic, the acceleration of what you're doing internally, surely? Again, it's, it's, it's back to, to those goals and, and, and interim targets that, that you set, you know. Uh, th there's, there's no use setting really targets for, for net zero if, for example, emerging markets and developing countries, which we've seen just in the panel before, before we just started, are completely missing from the narrative. To us, this is where, where we believe, as complex as may it is, involving all these stakeholders in a platform for you chart a clear path forward. Then you will see funding come into play. Then you see the industry coming into play. We can always debate whether this is existential or not. To us, oil and gas is not the issue. It's emissions that, that, that is the, the, the principle. Well, the IPCC we says it's existential. Well, you know, uh, it's, it's actually their say, why are, we, why are we or they discounting the role of technology? There's a significant amount of money that's being injected in technology by companies like Sabic, by companies like Saudi Aramco, by many of the IUCs out there to combat emissions from, from hydrocarbon combustible applications. So I'm, I'm not too sure why entities continue to insist to discount you know, technological advancements that, that will help us combat emissions. Let's pick up what Melissa and Gillian said and come back to you, Maha, because um, you've spent the last year trying to understand your footprint and setting climate goals. What have you discovered literally in the last year? Actually, the carbon uh, footprint, uh, it's a new topic and, and, and we are in an early stage in terms of the commitment, but I will, uh, uh, I like to mention that we, in STC, we try to work equally in E and S and G as well. So uh, we have a different, uh, success stories or something I, I, I'd love to mention here that uh, we try to use uh, our devices, the one we already, uh, as a recycling, we do, donate it by like 1,000 every year, uh, thousand of devices we donate it to underserved area in Kingdom to support the youth uh, in their education. So. Here we support social and we support environment as well. In terms of disclosure, when we look at the G, uh, we uh, already published the first and second, and next year, uh, next month, sorry, we will publish the third report, which is uh, uh, will support us with Melissa <laughs> in terms of the MSCI, ESG, all of the index to uh, to raise the flag about the. Uh, governance, the disclosure, and how will affect our positions in terms of uh, achieving the 17 uh, SDGs, achieving uh, uh, the target uh, with a carbon footprint, try to create an apps or solutions uh, with a, uh, uh, smart uh, solutions to reduce uh, the uh, carbon uh, footprint. As you said, Ma, that um, this is relative, this is new to you. Yeah. How much of a mindset change have you had to try and introduce within STC, and what success have you had? Uh, actually, we started uh, 2019, and, and it was a very difficult topic, and we had uh, many challenges uh, faced. But well, people didn't understand it? Yes, and some of them uh, think that uh, uh, sustainability is regard to green, uh, and smart uh, and something not, not E and S and G. And as uh, Richard mentioned earlier, that ESG is, a, is something not everyone uh, aware about it, and it's, it's a new topic in Saudi Arabia. But uh, nowadays, it's, uh, I would love yeah, to mention from London, uh, the, the, the source of uh, ESG, that 
it's it's a, a serious topic now in Saudi Arabia, and all of uh, Saudi companies, big companies, and listed companies uh, doing a great job. I, uh, uh, we had um, different meetings with our partners, with our peers, with our stakeholders from government, private sector, and NGOs as well, to make this file as a national file to show people that Saudi Arabia starts late, but not anymore. Minister and Gillian, and let, let's just use this as a reality check. When you look at your data and the companies you're talking to uh, and the data you're getting from them, how much does what we've just heard from Maha on the kingdom, reflect, is, is it reflected in the data from elsewhere in the world? We've got about a minute each, if we can. Melissa. <laughs> Um, well, we, we are seeing generally that the, the disclosure is, is greatly improving and we are, you know, seeing, you know, companies like STC improve in their ratings uh, using our methodology. So, well done. <laughs> Gillian. Um, I would just add that um, adaptation finance, um, transition finance are two huge topics. Uh, historically, uh, thinking about ESG investing, which included, let's say, exclusion um, and certain backward-looking characteristics. What we're seeing on the agenda now more and more, which I think fits, you know, KSA and lots of emerging market economies, is uh, forward-looking, long-term value creation, local adaptation, and uh, investing in the transition. And, of course, the investment needs there are huge. Bob, what's your view? Okay, you're in the kingdom at the moment. You were 20 years at Dow before that. What, what is your feeling about the way net zero is going to move? In other words, is it a, an ambition which, while it is at 2050, 2030, actually it practically will advance quite significantly because of the realization of the impact of science, which is why I mentioned the WMO report, mm -hmm. warning about 1.5 degree being passed at least once in the next five years. Yeah, look, I, I, I want to come back to in answering that question also to, to build on Ashraf's points. So, you know, when we, we sort of get this challenge of this is an existential threat and we, you know, we, we have to push the industry to move, the, the industry is moving. And again, the reality is we need greater renewable energy supply. We need support on infrastructure and storage. Uh, on the recycling infrastructure, right, because recycling is also a big piece of this equation. We need waste infrastructure supported by the right public policy in different regions. I mean, it's still more profitable in the U.S., to landfill than it is to recycle product. So these are things that are gonna be enabling. We're going to move, right? So if you look at our 2030 actions, they are real projects. They're committed to purchasing renewable electricity. You'll see these announcements publicly in the kingdom and globally. And could you advance from 2030? Well, the challenge with advancing, and I think this is something that's often not discussed, right? So we're moving very fast in the kingdom. When you look at the regulatory environment, I'll take Europe as an example. Uh, the timing to expand the grid which is a regulatory issue, is actually what hinders the advancement. It's not a willingness to purchase renewable electricity. It's what's a realistic ability to have that renewable energy supply. So that's why I think this dialogue has been pushed in the wrong direction. Like, we're committed to converting our energy supply. We're committed to bringing in greater blue and green hydrogen. We're committed to investing in carbon capture. We have real projects to deliver the 2030 number. But actually, what limits the delivery on 2030 is that infrastructure and support to, to do those projects. And it's not a financial issue. We're committed on the capital spend to make those projects happen. But to increase the renewable energy supply without the right regulatory environment to supply it uh, is going to be a gap. So we're pushing those points. I'll give one example of a way that uh, we think we can advance the dialogue, right? So we want to convert, as an example, our furnaces, uh, not just with hydrogen, but also with electricity, to electrify some of our furnaces. And that's a project that we're doing with BSF and Lindy uh, in Europe. The reason to bring that forward publicly is because if we're going to electrify those furnaces, we need a significant increase in renewable energy supply to support our conversion. But that's our way of pushing that dialogue. We're going to pilot the technology at a real scale, multi-megawatt scale, to show what can be done to drive this dialogue. And I think companies, that's a role companies need to play, is take risk, pilot solutions that can really drive the change, give examples of what could be numbered up to deliver real transition, but to then use that to force the dialogue on what's needed in support. Ashraf, last word to you. There'll be many out there who'll say, you've just turned in some most extraordinary profits. That means you'll go slow on going to net zero. You'll become complacent. No, not at all. 
we, we, we had, just like Sabic and many other international companies, we had carefully crafted plans, specific projects, specific investments that we wanted to do part of our decarbonization and, and, and uh, net zero commitments. These are specific projects. Some of them actually have started. You know, if anything, you know, I've, you know, having a strong financial condition will actually help us proceed you know, strongly with, with these plans. I just want to make two quick, quick comments, one to, to build further on Bob's point on the existential. I understand that this is a narrative out there. Interestingly, if you look at any energy outlook out there and pick your favorite consultant, everybody will tell you that oil and gas will continue to have a share in the future decarbonized world. It perhaps could be an existential issue for those companies that want to be complacent and decide to do nothing. You know, but certainly, you know, oil and gas will continue to be, to be a competitive enabler for future decarbonized economies. One other point I think you mentioned earlier, and, and many Quickly people... Quickly, if you can talk about is, is, you know, the race to net zero. I, I personally don't believe it is a race. We all have to get there together. You know, having isolated islands of excellence amongst developed world, you know, celebrating net zero, you know, uh, commitments while developing economies are struggling to get there is not going to solve the world's uh, climate or emission issues. All right. Well, thank you, the five of you, very much indeed. And I'm going to invite Edie back onto the platform. Can I tell you, I'm going to take my tie off and put on my sneakers. Uh, <laughs> to be more in tune. Thank you very much indeed at these uh, fascinating times.